Good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about identifying some patterns and fundamental assumptions in New Age thinking. So if you haven't heard of the term New Age before, it refers to well, an umbrella term, and it refers to the variety of spiritual practices and beliefs that were brought into the Western mainstream from uh, various Eastern religions, as well as Western esotericism, uh, especially in the last like two, 300 years or so. So some major players in this uh, space are someone named Helena Blavatsky, who was the co-founder of the Theosophical Society, or Theosophy, and this is probably the most prominent uh, force and organization that brought uh, New Age to the West. Uh, other players that you may have heard of before are Anton LaVey, founder of the Church of Satan, which sounds like it would be like very different from what New Age is practicing. But if you look at some of these websites, uh, a lot of the practices that they're advocating for are quite similar. Uh, and then the third one that I have here is Aleister Crowley, who was uh, an occultist uh, in England, and he was a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which is a Western esoteric uh, club, I guess. Uh, and then some of the key practices espoused by the New Age are things like crystals, certain kinds of meditation and yoga, astral projection, out-of-body experiences, psychedelics, psychic readings, channeling, divination, other magic charms and spells and other weird things like that. So uh, now that we've kind of covered some practices and key players in the New Age, I want to talk about some core principles and why they aren't biblical. So one core principle uh, in the New Age is elevating feeling above reason, which is an inversion of the true order that God intended, reason above feeling. Uh, and if you want to know more about this, you can go watch my video on emotionalism in the church. Uh, so in other words, this principle is something is true if I like the sounds of it or if it feels right. Um, and if it's true, if it feels, yeah, it feels good and I like it, basically. Uh, and <clears throat> you can find this principle spelled out in several books, New Age books, uh, and often they'll word it like, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Um, and one th a little tangent here, I just wanted to point out, this is weirdly similar to the harm principle from classical liberalism. Uh, the Declaration of France uh, during the French Revolution, called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, has a quote that sounds almost exactly like this New Age uh, concept. It says, Liberty consists in the freedom to do everything which injures no one else. Hence, the exercise of the natural rights of each man has no limits except which are assured to, this, to the other members of society the enjoyment of the same rights. Right? Now compare that to do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. Weirdly similar. <clears throat> uh, this principle obviously isn't biblical. I mean, there are definite things that God calls us to do as followers that we should do or shouldn't do. Uh, right? Um, like we should be charitable and care for the less fortunate and we should not murder, right? There are certain things that God uh, calls us to um, and do whatever we want is definitely not a biblical principle. <laughs> so these are not matters of personal choice, right? These are things we are called to by God. Uh, this principle is also what causes new agers to look to other spiritual powers for benefits aside from the Holy Spirit like the practices I mentioned at the beginning, uh, like crystals, channeling, etc., because they seem cool and like make someone feel good or whatever, I like like the idea of it. <clears throat> but yeah, the Bible doesn't like talk about this, so it's probably not that important. <clears throat> so uh, the second core principle is that there are multiple routes to heaven and you shouldn't judge another person's journey. Uh, and what goes along with this often is that Jesus was only a teacher, not a savior. And so they're kind of invalidating that verse um, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yeah, New Agers would not believe this, right? Because they think there's multiple routes to heaven. Uh, and we can ident identify this right away as a recapitulation of the Gnostic lie, which is that divine knowledge or gnosis of God is what saves you, not the atonement of Christ's death and resurrection. So uh, a bit of a confusion there on the part of the Gnostics. Uh, and this also, this principle of multiple routes to heaven fits really well with our postmodern zeitgeist and the subjectivity of truth. Uh, you might hear New Agers say something like, oh, live your own truth or whatever. Um, and they'll often, to support this, they'll take scripture out of context, right? Uh, Matthew 7, 1, do not judge. Uh, God has that, or Jesus has that principle. Um, and he, they'll, they'll also say things like God loves everyone. Uh, so in those two different things, I want to 
quickly address those. So in Matthew 7, 1, do not judge. Um, the way New Agers use this verse is they're like, oh, well, you can't tell me how I should live my life. Like, I should be able to do whatever I want, right? Uh, but really, that's not really what Jesus meant. <laughs> um, I mean, if you know some Bible stories, you'll also know the story of Jesus flipping the tables of the moneylenders in the temple. Uh, that's clearly a moral judgment that Jesus is acting on. And so by saying that Jesus thinks that people you shouldn't judge people, are you calling Jesus a hypocrite? Uh, instead of uh, saying that people ought not to judge at all, Jesus is warning against a particular kind of judgment. That is judging with arrogance, where we elevate ourselves above the other person, or we judge according to our own standards. Uh, in the following verse, Jesus goes on to say that the, the danger here is in our own standards of judgment, uh, which, if we apply to others, will be applied to us one day, and we will not pass our own harsh uh, standards. Uh, instead, we should judge with humility, and only according with God's standards, which are set out clearly in the Bible. So, in other words, it's okay to call out sin, so long as you do it from the right place, and you don't think that you're, like, different or better than the other person, uh, just because your sin looks different than theirs. So... Uh, and then in regards to the second thing, God loves everyone, so you should just like accept me, right? Um, for that, you can uh, bring up the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery who's going to be stoned. Um, Jesus doesn't say to her, oh, like, you get it, girl, girl boss, you know? He says, go and sin no more. Uh, and so love is not acceptance of lifestyle, right? Love is calling someone to exist in right relationship with reality and truth, which is Jesus Christ, right? So, yeah, that's important. Love is not acceptance of lifestyle. Uh, and then in regards to the second thing on this point, that Jesus wasn't uh, uh, a savior, he was just a good moral teacher, I want to point to something called Lewis's Trilemma from C.S. Lewis. And this is in his book, Mere Christianity. And basically, he's arguing that Jesus didn't really leave us the option of thinking that he was just a good moral teacher. The way that it goes is like, Jesus was either mad, a liar, or he was what he claimed to be, the son of God. I'm just going to read an excerpt here from Lewis's Mere Christianity, where he formulates this trilemma. <clears throat> so, uh, he says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let, but let none of us come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. So, again, that's basically just countering the idea that Jesus was just a good moral teacher. Uh, and Lewis is kind of showing us how that doesn't really make any sense. <clears throat> uh, and then, of course, the Bible has many uh, verses about uh, there not being multiple routes to heaven. Uh, so we can cite those as well, like John 14.6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, Acts 4.12 And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, which we must be saved. Uh, so yeah, there's no other path to heaven or eternal life except through Jesus. Uh, and uh, another thing that they'll do to support their, the New Agers, I mean, what they'll do to support their selection of like, random spiritual practices that they like pick and choose from other religions is this idea of like hey there's no one clear path to heaven they can kind of do whatever they want um which is like a lack of coherence right you can't just like pick and choose um different uh rituals or pre spiritual practices out of their context um like yoga is a good example right like westerners basically have totally neutered what yoga is <laughs> And they've pulled it out of their, out of its like Hindu roots, uh, and it makes no sense um, other than a good stretch. <laughs> so, uh, and all of these ideas of like people choosing their own spiritual path is connected to the idea that New Agers have that organized religion only ever existed to control people, 
And so that now that society is free from this control of oppressive religion, um, they can people are free to uh, explore their own spirituality without any mentors or traditions or teachings to guide them. Like people are just smart enough to like figure out spirituality by themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and so they pick things according to their own preferences, which is obviously totally misguided. Um, I don't think humans have a very good intuition when it comes to spiritual practice. Um, they tend to gravitate towards weird things like the practices I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and a lot of what new, the New Age promises sounds really great, right? Like the ideas of love, acceptance, self-improvement, things like this. Um, but the thing is, is that Satan will give you nine truths with one lie, and he'll sneak a lie in there, and that one lie will lead to your destruction. Um, and he also knows that people aren't stupid. You can't just torture people outright and send them to hell. You need to kind of be sneaky with it. And so Satan will use this like Trojan horse method to sneak lies in alongside some truths. Um, and the Bible says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light, meaning that you can what you think will seem good might actually be death itself, right? So, and this brings us to the third and final principle that I want to identify in New Age thinking, and this is the most fundamental. It's the idea that you don't need God because you can save yourself. In other words, you are God. Um, and this is, if you dig deep enough, this is what New Age always comes to, this idea of that you are God and you are capable to save yourself. Which is super funny and ironic because if you go to the Bible, it's literally the oldest lie in the book. Like story of Genesis um, 3 verses 4 to 5, um, Satan is tempting Eve with this exact thing, right? Like we'll, we'll read the verse. It says, um, the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, right? Like this idea that that men are not actually creation, they're God, is like the oldest line in the book, right? <clears throat> so don't let them catch you with that. Uh, and another thing New Agers like to do is they'll misquote John 10, 34, where Jesus is answering the Pharisees and he says, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. Um, and they take it to mean like in some mystical sense, like, whoa, like people are gods, like Jesus said it. <laughs> but it's totally ripped out of context, right? Like um, what Jesus is talking about here is small g gods, not capital G God himself and he's referring to either judges or angelic beings which are referenced in Psalm 82 1 and the New Testament calls these same angelic beings principalities and powers in heavenly places uh, that's Ephesians 3 10 if you're wondering and in this situation Jesus is quoting this verse not as a way to tell everyone that they are actually secretly God but instead as a way to deflect the accusation of blasphemy by calling attention to the fact that the Psalms uses the same term gods uh, as beings less than God um, so he's basically pulling a sneaky maneuver to get out of this blasphemy accusation. He's basically trolling the Pharisees. Um, and because the Pharisees don't want to accuse the psalmist or God of blasphemy, they kind of back off and he gets, they get confused. And then he just uses that opportunity to escape. He just runs away. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that would be John verse 10, verse 39. Uh, so yeah, pretty funny. Uh, and then, obviously, in regards to quoting Bible verses about man uh, not being God <laughs> and him being man, uh, I have a few of them here. Uh, Acts 14, 11 to 15 says, When the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of uh, Lycaonia, sorry about that, I don't know how to say that, uh, they said, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. So basically, these people that he's, Paul's preaching to are like, whoa, this guy isn't even a man, he's God. Uh, and then skipping ahead to, uh, verse 14, when, which, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran among the people crying out saying, sirs, why do you say these things? We are also, of, we are also men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. So basically these, um, people that Paul's preaching to are like, yo, this guy's like, he's God. And they're like, no, no, we're not. Stop saying that. <laughs> uh, and then again in Acts 12, 21 to 23. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people give a shout, saying, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God not the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. <laughs> so this <laughs> this. This guy, this king, he's like, makes a good speech and his subjects are like, wow, this is a god. And then because he didn't say, no, I'm not a god, an angel just killed him. <laughs> so yeah, 
the Bible is like pretty clear that men are not God. Uh, and then uh, one more here, Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. All right, that's pretty clear, straightforward. So yeah, if if uh, the New Agers are right and God really thinks, or Jesus really says that everyone is like a God, um, the Bible probably would set a better biblical precedent for that being true. Um, but that's just not the case if you look at the scripture. <clears throat> so yeah, that's the end of the video. Uh, in summary, we learned about three key uh, core principles uh, in New Age thinking that we should be ready to identify and call out, uh, not only in our fellow believers, but also um, in other people. So those were elevating feeling above reason or uh, emotion before uh, logic, or that's a bad way of saying it, feeling above reason. Uh, and then denying the key role of Jesus in man's salvation, right? So, you know, live your truth, things like that. Uh, and then the third principle being that thinking that man is God and uh, that they don't need God because they can save themselves, right? So those are the three core principles. Thanks for listening. Have a good one.